So I just want to welcome everyone to the second webinar in the series of the birds and the bees of sustainable gardening. Um, we are recording this webinar today so that people who can't join us can watch the webinar later. Uh, my name is Catherine Forster and I've been running the Faith in the Common Good outdoor greening program in Ottawa since 2016 when we created our first uh, two resources here for Ottawa. Uh, some 10 fact sheets and 10 case studies on sustainable gardening. And um, we also have a network of local interfaith gardeners. And uh, definitely let me know if you would like to join and I can uh, send you information about that. First, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm working in the unceded territory of the Algonquin people. I'd like to pay respect to both the land and the people, including all indigenous peoples who have walked in this place and who are the traditional guardians of this land. I want to recognize their long-standing relationship with this territory where they have lived since time immemorial and honor those that call Ottawa home. The Algonquins were one of the first indigenous nations that Champlain recorded as he traveled up the Kitchissippi, now called the Ottawa Utaway River. Algonquin territory that includes rivers, lakes, forests, wetlands, other habitat, and also four-legged, winged, and finned creatures consists of 48 million acres in what is now Ontario and Quebec, which is uh, divided now because of our current settler laws and governance. And thanks to the generous funding support from TDFEF, we are able to offer this winter webinar outdoor greening series. So I definitely want to say thanks to them. As I mentioned last time, this foundation was started by the TD Bank Group in 1990. It's one of the biggest community environmental foundations in Canada. In those 30 years, they've supported around 27,000 local initiatives, including education, urban greening initiatives, outdoor classrooms, habitat restoration, and lots more. So in case we don't have, uh, in case we do have some new people um, to the webinar, I just wanted to give a quick overview of our organization, Faith in the Common Good. So we are founded on the belief that our diverse faith congregations and spiritual communities can be powerful role models for the common good. And we support these communities that wish to contribute to greener, healthier, and more resilient neighborhoods. So that's what our, organiz our organization does. In case, um, uh, and also our founders saw this spiritual truth, a common value system that wove its way through all faith communities in terms of social values, common good, caring for the earth and each other. And so here uh, at Faith in the Common Good, we support various environmental projects, uh, different kinds of initiatives such as recycling, solar power. Uh, we have an energy benchmarking um, program right now to look at your energy consumption. And of course, the one we're here for today is outdoor greening. So we provide support in uh, outdoor greening for different types of projects. And we offer various resources online. A lot of the ones online are free. And also we um, provide these networking opportunities also trying to connect different faith community members to learn from their peers. And then um, if they need help with some initial efforts, whether it's a bit of funding support or some native plants, uh, we're there also. So um, first of all, I'd like um, to ask, what is your gardening experience? Let's see if I can get the um, poll going here. Um, I'll launch this one. So we just have a really quick poll in terms of what is your gardening experience and then are you gardening at home? I'll do that one next. All right, perfect. Thank you so much. So it looks like we have one person who's gardened for a few years and the other person who's done gardening and also done some sustainable work outdoors also. And then the other one is, where are you gardening? So I'll just get that one up. Uh, let's see if I can find it. There we go, poll two, where do you garden? So the idea is, is to find out, you may be gardening at home and at your faith community, but we really wanna see um, if you're gardening at your faith community or if you're only gardening somewhere else. All right, that's great. So right now we just have people who are gardening at home. Thank you so much. 
So I just um, thought I would put um, an overview of the presentation so you kind of know where we're going and uh, what we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, a really quick overview of why we should help. Uh, the first presentation that we did a couple weeks ago really kind of dove into that in terms of the situation today and um, uh, why um, sustainable and uh, ecological gardening. Um, and then we'll talk a bit about um, general habits and characteristics of our local wild bees and then how to help in your garden. And um, one of the other things we wanted to do tonight, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, was profile, they're not completely new, they've been around for about two or three years now, um, a local organization that really focuses on wild pollinators. And um, so what we'll do is we'll actually take their new online pollinator resource that they've done for faith communities. And we'll intersperse that with some wild bee profiles so we can kind of get to know the bees, what kind of flowers they like, what are their sort of habits, you know, in your gardens. And also um, highlighting the, the tips from this new online pollinator resource. And then we'll also talk about some other support um, from this uh, new organization, Wild Pollinator Partners. And um, then we'll just do a, a quick summary at the end and have some questions, discussions if we have time. So the first webinar focused on the importance of doing the sustainable work and why there is a need. And I don't wanna repeat all the information, but just for this webinar, we'll focus a bit on the pollinators, including bees. Um, so we talked about the sharp decline in insects, that sort of insect Armageddon headline that we had seen, I think it was last summer, or last year at some point. Um, the article was saying there's about a 41% decline in insects overall, uh, just in the past decade, which is, an al which is alarming for us. Um, the proportions even in the last two decades have been quite um, high. And, <sighs> The study sort of alluded to the fact that it's maybe um, due to agriculture int intensification and also including those chemicals that um, this agriculture would be using. Um, bees may not be the only species that provide pollinator services, but they are a key one, especially as they collect the nectar. And then many of us think foremost of the introduced European honeybee as the bee that pollinates all of our food. But there's, um, there's really been some late, uh, some education recently, um, you know, where people are learning a bit more about wild bees, you know, mason bee boxes are being built and we're talking about bumblebees and, and other bees that people are starting to get familiar with. So there's a bit of a shift in, in culture, which is great in terms of people understanding that there's um, quite a diversification of bees out there. Um, there's about 800 species of native bees in Canada, and there are eight um, that are endangered in Canada. So wild bees are facing um, the same threats as honeybees, climate change factors, pesticide use, diseases, habitat loss, fragmentation, but they're also being affected because they're, many of them are ground nesters. So some of these nesting spots may be laden with chemicals, especially if they're using agricultural areas. So the, there is that question of whether they're being um, affected even more because of their habits in terms of where they lay eggs, et cetera. So the idea is, is that perhaps cities may be the best refuge right now in terms of uh, native bees, especially in the suburbs and, and um, other areas where there's probably a lot more gardens and a bit more green space. And especially if cities are now doing um, chemical bans, so there's less uh, pesticides in cities. So, and why should we really care about wild bees? And the, the real answer, I guess, would be that, you know, the healthiest um, bees are ones that have a diverse and robust genetics, which means that you know, they're gonna be more resilient against any types of threats that may happen. And, um, and this is also why commercially raised bees are not helpful, and that's not just European honeybees, there are some other um, commercially raised bees, bumblebees and alfalfa, I think it's leafcutter bees, that, um, that are shipped to different areas to help again with pollination, because they're really, uh, you know, in, you know, they're, they're inbred a bit, um, they really don't have the healthy genetics that wild bees would have. And we don't really want them mixing with our healthy wild bee pop, uh, populations. 
So just in case, um, I had this question last year, just a quick review about pollination. So pollination is, um, is really important because it's how the plant gets fertilized, which thus um, creates the seeds, which are the nuts and fruits that many of us you know, eat and also um, allows the plant to reproduce. So bees are one of the many species that provide these pollination services. Other insects that pollinate are like wasps, flies, butterflies, um, I'm just going to pause for a second here. Um, ants, moths, and even more. Um, but pollination um, of all these food crops are so important because we really do uh, rely on these insects. There's only a few foods such as rice, wheat, and corn that are wind pollinated um, that don't need the help and services of these pollinator so now we're going to get on to meeting our local wild bee. Just check to see if there's any questions. So most wild bees are solitary and they don't have large colonies like honeybees. They'll lay their eggs in tunnels, uh, stems, holes in wood. Um, we'll learn a bit more about that later. The one other social bee uh, is the bumblebee. And I do have a profile on that, so um, we'll talk about the bumblebee specifically later. And there's different size bees, so as to help pollinate different size flowers. They also have long tongues or short tongues, so some of them may be um, more specialized in terms of being able to access specific types of flowers. And some of them really kind of end up being generalists. Bees are attracted to certain colors they can see in the ultraviolet light. And then they uh, overwinter as larvae and some um, overwinter as adults. And then they'll emerge in the spring and they'll have their, their life cycle until it's just the larvae again. So I have a couple of images that I took from Craig P. Burroughs. I, you may have seen this. I think this has been um, shown in some social media. I think it was just the end of last year. It was pretty recent. So he has these beautiful um, images of flowers in alternative light that he's showing. So this, these ones would sort of demonstrate what, in, what the bees are seeing when they're approaching these flowers. And you can sort of see it's almost like the flowers are sending out signals, you know, um, of where the bees should be going. But I really wanted to feature Craig just so that you know um, you can buy his prints. Um, he has a really amazing talent there. So also, in terms of meeting your local wild pollinators, I wanted to do a little bit in terms of the other uh, insects and creatures that uh, do help out also. It's rather interesting that flies are second in importance to bees in terms of pollinating insects. And um, flies are essential for one flower, the cocoa tree flower. They're, they're the main pollinator for that. But lots of other fruits and vegetables are pollinated with help from flies. Pears, apples, strawberries, cherries, plums, um, fennels, coriander, caraway, just tons and tons of um, food that flies also help with. And the great thing is, is the flies can provide these services when bees can't. So uh, adult flies have lower energy requirements and they also remain active at lower temperatures than bees do. Now butterflies are another pollinator, but they're actually um, might not be as helpful as we may think. So um, we're gonna be profiling that a bit more in the last webinar. And other insect pollinators are wasps, moths, beetles, uh, birds, and bats. And I think that in our next webinar, the third one, Canadian Wildlife um, Federation is going to talk a bit about the other pollinators. So for now, we'll just get back to the bees. So we'll talk about how to actually help in your garden next. So we first want to think about flowers but not just the flower, but more um, also the plant material. So we wanna think about nesting materials and access to them for uh, bees. Native plants, some have hollow stems such as asters. Um, they, 
bees also need access to bare ground, you know, to access clay and mud, but also to um, lay their eggs in tunnels underground. So we'll talk a bit about the different materials that bees use as we're looking at the bee profiles. Now colors for bees that they're attracted to are pinks, purples, and yellows. They, I think it's they can't see red. I think that's what it is. Um, so we do want a diversity in colors. You want a diversity in flower size and a, a, in terms of timing of bloom. So you really wanna think about early spring all the way to late fall. We hear a lot about like saving those dandelions for the bumblebees that come out early in the spring. Also, we need to avoid uh, double blooms such as ornamental roses, camellias, marigolds, and carnations, because these are very hard to access if there's any pollen at all. Um, you know, just, I'm always happy to see annuals and perennials mixed together and some ornamentals mixed with native plants. Um, you know, we really do wanna enjoy our garden, so there's no problem with that, but just to think of that balance in terms of plants that provide um, bees and other wildlife, with uh, food sources and other resources and the plants that we can enjoy also. So as I mentioned, definitely want to think about native perennial plant plants and less annuals. And we also want to really ask ourselves if we're purchasing cultivars. So we want to ask when we're at the nursery if this is a true native plant and as, especially if it's local. So locally grown plants are better adapted to our local climates. Um, but also um, if they're a cultivar, like so you may see, I can't really think of any right now, but you may seem like a golden bloom or, you know, luscious sunrise or something like that. So they'll have you know, perhaps asters that are named that, or even I think there's some cultivar goldenrods. And those um, may end up being sterile also. So when you're breeding for a specific um, feature in a flower, you may actually end up losing some other things also. So native is always best. And then the one thing that I had um, learned um, at another webinar is really um, clustering them and grouping them so that the bees don't have as long of a distance to travel from flower to flower. So it's always great to have a, a large cluster of flowers rather than a line of them. And one other thing that I was thinking of is um, that I've talked about in other presentations is using rainwater. Now this is more for the plants, but the idea is that when you're using rainwater, um, it's highly oxygenated water. It doesn't have chemicals that you would have um, from treated water that you're getting from the city. And it's also at air temperature, which is much um, more uh, kind to plants, I guess. It doesn't shock them as much. So all that will result in um, healthier plants, better blooms, and all that. So the big question, I guess, would be when you're looking at your garden and how you want to maybe make some changes or adjustments to it and think about sustainable and ecological um, ideas, is um, how much space do you have? Do you have space for a native tree or shrub? Or do you just have a, a spot that you want to put a new garden bed in? Or perhaps you've already sort of designed your garden and you just want to add some native plants to garden beds that you already have. So that's always a really good thing to do at the beginning is assess your space. And keep in mind that um, trees and shrubs offer an amazing um, habitat for many insects also. Um, they really are quite a world, really, to many, many insects. So it's always good if you have a bit of space, um, considering, again, a native, not a cultivar tree. Um, there's been a lot of talk about being as organic as possible. Um, luckily, in Ottawa, there's uh, quite a bit of uh, pesticide not allowed anymore to be used in yards. But also, we want to consider when we're purchasing plants how they've been raised. We want to ask for chemical-free plants. When you're looking for these types of plants, you might want to get some um, from a neighbor if you know that, if they know that it's a native plant or find a local organization or even grow it from seed so you know exactly um, how it's been raised. Uh, and we'll talk a bit about um, places that you can purchase these um, in the last webinar. I'm just going to take a glass, a sip here. 
And, and I always like to ask people, you know, keep asking at your a local nursery for flowers that don't have these chemicals on them. Because I think the more we ask for them, the more the nurseries are going to really think about this and uh, deliver on what we need, especially annuals too. It would be great if we could have, like, you know, chemical-free annuals. Um, we really want to avoid the neonicotinoids, um, which th there have been studies on in terms of how they can affect um, our insect populations. And we'll talk a bit more about that in the last webinar too. Um, and then the bare ground. So some of us may have weed cloths that might be um, a barrier for bees and other insects to get down into the ground. Um, you know, many of us use mulch, so we may want to create some spaces um, where there's actually no mulch so that, again, bees and insects can uh, get under, um, into the ground. And there are some, some bees that really are looking for clay. So if you're really um, invested in this idea, you, and you could dig up until you get past the organic layer and get a little bit of clay and then um, deposit a bit of clay sort of on the ground for some bees also. Uh, bees are looking for this opportunity to, you know, make some mud. Um, and also it's great for butterflies. Also, m butterflies will do some mud puddling to actually um, access some, some uh, minerals that they need. So look at those opportunities too. And then another great thing to do would be to offer some water. So that's a, like a simple thing, like a little shallow flat dish with some rocks in it so that the bees have something to sort of land on. And um, they're always looking for water also. The other thing we really want to think about in terms of creating a space for bees is thinking about messy gardening and winter gardens. So, We've seen a lot um, in terms of don't rake your leaves anymore. Um, the idea would be maybe you know, push them into the garden or you could even create sort of a space under trees where there's no grass and you just kind of leave the leaves there and, and allow it to um, break down and add nutrients to the soil. But also those insects are using these leaves to overwinter. Uh, they could be on leaves, in turn, they could be under leaves, and leaves also provide a moisture barrier uh, for insects that are just below the ground. You know, we really want to sort of look for signs in terms of where insects are overwintering. You may see some plant galls, which you'll see um, in terms of raised shapes on, uh, on leaves and things like that. You may see tiny eggs, um, and you may see tunnel entrances that bees have made. Your winter garden is kind of like that, where you're leaving up seed heads, you're leaving up plants and stems, so that again, it provides some habitat for um, insects that are overwintering. Fireflies, a little bit you know, off topic, but you know, again, they also really appreciate messy gardening. They're looking for grasses where they can hide during the day and um, you know, perhaps providing like a quiet spot for them at the back. Um, and you know, not mowing in a corner can provide you know, that extra habitat. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. Uh, one of the things when we're talking about sort of urban meadows, and if we wanted to create an urban meadow is you could cut down a third of the meadow or two thirds of the meadow every year and just allow at least one third to regenerate. So you don't have to cut it all, you know, leave it all up or you know, you know, cut it all down. And uh, even in terms of leaves, you know, make sure that you have leaves in all the important spots, you know, have some in your compost and it doesn't have to be all or nothing. And then when you're doing spring and fall maintenance, you wanna keep an eye out like where you may be digging um, and also where you might be pruning. And they were saying, I think it's 10 degrees Celsius um, in the spring is when you can start doing yard clear, um, cleanup. So before that, there still may be some insects that are overwintering. And then after that, you can do um, clean up your gardens. So now we're gonna get on to um, the new local organization and start doing some wild bee profiles. So the new organization has been around for a couple of years now, um, but we really wanted to profile them in this uh, webinar because um, we're talking about pollinators and bees specifically. And also they just created a new resource for faith communities. So I wanted to feature that. So they um, are supporting 
wild pollinators and empowering people who care. They are there to raise awareness, share information and resources, offer learning opportunities and events. And a lot of those uh, will be on uh, uh, Fletcher Wildlife Gardens. Um, they may be featuring other webinars like such as this one. They also are trying to support um, others who are creating pollinator habitat, whether it's protecting some of it or creating new pollinator habitat. And they are really there to encourage appropriate, responsible action. And they're providing quite a lot of information online, on their blog, on their website. So this is our first bee profile. So the bumblebee, as I was mentioning, is the one social bee that we're going to be profiling here. Um, they can have up to 50 um, eggs in the nest and they do have worker bees. So uh, when I was compiling these profiles, there was a, you know, um, some great information out there and especially in Wikipedia and then another one was pollinator, let me see if I can find it here, pollinator, pollination, prairie pollination. Um, and also I use uh, Illinois wildflower um, website quite a lot also, uh, but some of the um, information uh, I found was maybe a little bit uh, contradictory, but it could be just that, you know, different sizes are, um, uh, or, you know, other information about bees. It may be that people are talking about a specific bees in a certain country and not globally, or maybe Canada. And, you know, so that may contradict a little bit there. But so generally, um, uh, this is the information uh, that I, or I'm very excited about to talk about today. So our bumblebees can come in um, different sizes and um, bumblebees are long tongue. So long tongue means over 5.5 millimeters, but of course, depending on the size of the bee, the tongue will um, vary also. So there's no information really about the, the length of each tongue or whatever, but there's just sort of an idea of this is a long tongued, medium or short tongued insect. Um, so some of their favorite flowers. So I had a really fun time compiling these, but this is not exhaustive. And um, a lot of bees you'll find, you know, will like the same types of flowers and, um, and definitely it's, it's very um, exciting to sort of see what bees, you know, which bees are, are using which flowers. But this gives you some ideas in terms of maybe what you want to plant. So milkweeds, a berry shrubs, wild geraniums, a coreopsis, goldenrods, and asters. So their nests are underground in uh, burrows or in um, trees. Um, they might use old rodent burrows and then holes that they'll find in trees. And then um, they need to be above 30 degrees Celsius to fly. So you'll find, I don't have any other profiles about this um, particular fact, but certain bees will need to warm up to a certain amount to be able to fly. And sort of the same thing with butterflies also. So uh, there's 40 species in Canada. Um, including the endangered rusty patch. And it was interesting, you know, in terms of habitat, there's some question of whether the rusty patch um, bumblebee um, needs oak savanna to, um, as its habitat, but that's not really been confirmed. Um, but other um, interesting names for bumblebees were belted, forest bumblebee, bumblebees, fuzzy horned, polar. So you do have some up very, you know, far in the north, um, white tailed bun bumblebees. And then the bumblebee is known for buzz pollination. So it's a way of vibrating the flowers to release more pollen. Some plants need this, such as tomatoes, peppers, cranberries. And this, as we talked about before, means that, you know, the bumblebee is one of those species that's commercially grown. So um, with the Wild Pollinator Pol Partners, I wanted to profile this new resource that they have online. So it's available online to download, um, supporting wild, wild pollinators at your faith communities. So the idea is, is that you know, most faith communities have a beautifully established um, garden landscape already, but where could you help, um, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> where could you make a few changes in terms of supporting pollinators on your property? 
So another native bee feature is the leaf cutter bee. So it's a solitary bee and the sizes for the leaf cutter range from five to 24 millimeters. And it's another long tongued bee. Some of its favorite flowers are the um, helianthus, the sunflower, prairie clover, coneflowers, milkweed, um, tick trefoils, asters, and goldenrods, those flowers that are really important in the fall. Um, it also has been known to use maple leaves and Virginia creeper leaves when it's um, using, when it's cutting the leaf to, to seal the egg cells. So they build their nest cells in hollow twigs or ground burrows, and then they seal each cell with this neatly cut um, leaf or perhaps some chewed leaf petals, depending on the type of uh, leaf cutter bee that it is. It's in the same family as the mason bee, carter bee, and the resin bee. And then it feeds on nectar and pollen, and its pollen carrying structure is different than some of other bees. Um, it only can carry it on the ventral surface of its abdomen rather than in the hind legs, which some other bees do. So in terms of the new, um, resource from Wild Pollinator Partners, their first tip is to identify and protect existing areas that are already supporting pollinators. So the idea is to sort of look around and see what you have. And then, um, you know, perhaps you have some patches of wildflowers, some plants that we may consider as, you know, unwanted, but these may offer food and shelter to pollinators, such as dandelions, clover, violets, daisy, fleabane, milkweed, a primrose, queen and lace, goldenrod, asters, and um, some lobelias also. So long grasses, if there's any sort of corners where there's some long grass, um, they can provide shelter and nesting areas as we've talked about. And then of course the bare soil is important. And then they also talked about um, hedges. So hedges can also provide nesting sites and shelter for bees. And then stone walls or brush piles also help in terms of overwintering sites. So another bee that we wanted to feature was the sweat bee. Now this is a smaller size bee. It's a solitary one and it's short tongued. Um, its favorite flowers, daisy fleabane, because it's so small, blue-eyed grass, wild columbine, swamp milkweed, lobelia, shooting star, goldenrod, and aster. Goldenrod and aster are just great for so many insects. Now it's a, a solitary nest in soil. Um, it's looking for sort of clay, sandy areas near streams perhaps, and then it uses um, some of the pollen and nectar um, as a deposit and seals it into the cell so that the larva has something to eat when um, it's born. The colors of a sweat bee do vary. So some can be black or brown, but some can be very metallic. And then some will have highlights, um, yellow, copper, red, or blue. And then some species, now again, I don't know if this is Canada or if it's somewhere else in terms of the sweat bees, but some species of sweat bees are crespular, which means that they're active at dusk. You know, they're not seen so much during the day. So the next tip that Wild Pollinator Partners had was to plant for a season long flowering. Now this is a slide that I had used last year for some presentations that I did at Faith Communities, but um, it sort of, it shows some of those flowers that, you know, we're already starting to talk about. Um, but, you know, thinking about different bloom times like Canada anemone, violets, prairie smokes are uh, spring flowers. And then you get to late spring, uh, early summer, and uh, full summer, like wild indigo, wild bergamot, black-eyed Susans, even brown-eyed Susans, yarrow, sankfoy, coneflowers, fireweed, milkweeds. And then as you get sort of in terms of late summer and then into fall, you may be seeing you know, evening primrose, blanket flowers, pearly everlasting, common sneezeweed, obedient plant, um, the monardas, and then in the fall, asters and goldenrods. And even asters and goldenrods have um, very uh, many different types and they have different bloom times. So you can even have sort of a, a long season of different goldenrods blooming and or um, asters 
Um, so I'm showing some of them just to get, show you that, you know, there's different colors, different sizes, different shapes of flowers that we can plant and even um, we can plant some grasses also. And so the next um, bee that we're going to feature is the carpenter bee. So the interesting uh, description that I read online was, um, you know, in terms of trying to identify it, it's a large size bee. So if you think of a bumblebee as a pickup truck, you would think a uh, carpenter bee as a Mack truck. So it's a large bee. Um, size 12 to 25, perhaps even more. And then the tongue, I had a little bit of difficulty in terms of confirming it. Some were saying short tongue, some were saying long tongue. Um, and of course, there's a variety of carpenter bees, so maybe that also changes depending on the bee. So, favorite flowers, these were sort of um, decide, these were determined because of the short tongue. So, they would be looking at open faced, shallow flowers like. Rubecchias, lobelias, violets, um, blue star, and dogwood, but also penstemons, verbanes, and other flowers like that. There's this um, uh, term of like robber bees. Like they can actually sort of get under the flower to um, access the nectar uh, rather than going down through the flower if they um, can't do it with uh, a long tongue or the size of themselves. So it doesn't stop them sometimes, but then it doesn't help pollinate the plants. So um, these bees may have some simple social nests, so there could be another social bee, and then they're also known to be solitary. So they lay eggs in holes made in wood, um, so they are also known as a bit of as a pest. Um, they are able to bore into unsealed wood. And then smaller carpenter bees, they'll construct nests in elderberry or sumac pits because these are hollow. And then like other bees, but I'm just featuring it here, they do have predators. So woodpeckers, shrikes, um, praying mantis, you know, will um, try to get at them. So in terms of the next tips, so there's four tips, this is the third one, is the thought of looking at your faith community garden and cultivating the shadows and other marginal spaces, such as dry spots or oddly shaped spaces. So you really want to, you really could consider filling these with native plant species. So shady corners are great for woodland wildflowers, perhaps a shrub or something like that, maybe something that blooms early. Um, dry spots are not a problem for hardy native perennials. And even some flowering herbs, you know, we, it doesn't have to all be native. Um, so it's in terms of dry spots, there are some herbs that can really handle dry spots. And then Ottawa is really known for its heavy clay soils, but there are quite a few native plants that are known as clay busters. So they can actually really get down there in the clay and they have no problem accessing and surviving in clay. So that would be another good option in terms of if you are having difficulty growing some plants in your area. And then, you know, there's always that thought of like an oddly shaped nook that you can't really use for anything else. Um, perhaps it could, you could add some ground cover or a brush or a rock pile, you know, tucked away where in, people can't really see it, which really helps in terms of nesting and overwintering for insects and bees. So another bee that we're going to profile tonight is the mining bee. This is another solitary bee, um, eight millimeters to 15, so kind of a medium-sized bee, and it's a short-tongued bee. So, and they were saying that, um, Mining bees um, really are looking, are, so one of the ones that uh, wake up really early, emerge early, so they're looking for spring flowers, um, very important to the species, so it's, uh, lots of trees will be flowering in the spring, some flower before they even leaf out. Um, daisy fleabane is another great one for smaller bees, wild strawberries, bergamot, golden alexander, which is a great plant that's, you know, semi-shade, tolerate semi-shade. Now, it's another ground nesting uh, bee. It, prefer, it prefers sandy soil and sometimes, you know, under shrubs, so the, the uh, ground, the nest is shaded. Um, it will pupate over winter and the um, egg cell is sort of uh, created with a waxy waterproof paste to seal each cell. Now this is the largest genus with over 1300 species, around 70 in Ontario.
And so our last tip from Well Pollinator Partners for Faith Community Spaces is planting edges with pollinator strips or hedges, depending on space available. So if you're looking at a space um, that's a larger size, like if you're in a suburb faith community and you have some space, you could perhaps think about a hedge um, to plant. So these linear spaces provide connectivity. So they allow the insects to thrive and travel um, safely from different areas of your garden and uh, from different flowers to other flowers. So pollinator strips don't have to be that wide. You can start at 50 centimeters, like about half a meter or more. And you can even include some green vegetation like native grasses and things like that. Now, a pollinator hedge, you'll need a lot more space, like two to four meters in width, depending on the hedges that you're using. And you really wanna combine it with shrubs, um, vines, native ground cover, so you can create this kind of diverse habitat. And um, different shrubs can offer fruits, seeds, or nuts, which can you know, attract other types of wildlife also, but also, again, provides that variety in flowers for native bees. Now flowers, you know, in terms of those strips can support around, you know, up to 100 species. I think a goldenrod supports maybe 114, 120 species. That's what's um, been said. But if you think about shrubs and trees, now that number of insects that it supports can go up to in hundreds. You know, we're talking 300 different types of species. That's again why we were talking about considering trees and especially native trees on your property. So I think we have two more bee features and we have just, uh, hopefully we'll be able to get through it all. Um, so the mason bee is another solitary bee. And of course this is a, a very well known bee now because many people are building mason bee boxes. Um, if you are interested in mason bee box, it's really important to know that these boxes have to be um, taken care of every year. They have to be cleaned. Um, they have to be, um, they have to be a certain type of shelter. Um, you really want to make sure that you're offering the bee a safe spot. Sometimes it's really better just to offer uh, bees natural habitat so they can create their own um, nests in twigs and underground and um, you know wood and things like that rather than doing these features. So it's something to think about in terms of how much time you may have to manage that. Um, size again 7 to 16 they have stouter bodies than some bees and they're long-tongued bees. So again, some of their um, flowers, fruit blossoms, asters, like we, oops, I've got asters twice, penstemon, comb flowers, black-eyed Susans. Now, as we know, it's sort of like they lay eggs in the hollow stems or twigs, and that's why we're drilling holes in those mason bee boxes for them. They seal each cell with mud, and that's why they have their name as a mason, you know, in terms of masonry. And um, some of them are metallic, some of them have dark colors, and they also, they don't have pollen baskets on their legs. They'll carry it on um, hairs on their abdomen. So in terms of faith communities, the other thought in terms of supporting pollinators on your property um, is if your faith community offers community gardening, like food gardening for their neighborhood or for your parishioners. So by attracting more pollinators, this will really benefit um, the food gardens in terms of creating better food, a larger uh, taste better. Um, there was this study done, I think it was on strawberries that really showed that if there was a diversity of bees, including wild bees that were pollinating, the strawberries um, were larger um, than other strawberries. Now, when you're thinking about community garden, you're probably already thinking about organic pest control, but you want to, um, you know, think about that also in terms of the bees that are supporting your garden. And then um, when you're also thinking about creating a little bit of a pollinator garden um, to help support your community garden, you probably want to think about plants that you don't have to spend much time in terms of maintaining them. So you want to think drought tolerant plants, you know, again, these types of clay buster native plants, so that you don't have to spend a lot of time on the pollinator plants and you can really focus on your food garden. Now, um, while Pollinator Partners also has this pollinator habitat assessment tool, um, it allows you to rate your pollinator habitat and gives you an idea of what else you might want to be adding to your space to support pollinators. 
And I think this is our last bee. Yep, it's our last bee. So the masked bee is one of the very small bees. Um, short tongue, but it can access deep into flowers due to its small size. So spring flowers, um, linden tree flowers, bone set, pen stem in, um, blackberries, probably other berries, a mountain mint, and again, those wild strawberries. So it nests in dead hollow twigs or plant stems. And then it, of course, it seals each cell. Um, it carries pollen in a crop, so the foregut rather than on the legs or the abdomen, and then regurgitates it. And then many are black, hairless, um, with yellow or white markings. And there's your image of the bee. So we're going to go on to um, just look at the Wild Pollinator Partner um, other resources on their website and then do a final summary. And if we have time, we can do some questions or discussions if anybody has any. So on their website, uh, they do have a blog. So you'll find garden tips there, pollinator ID information, research updates and things like that. So it's great to um, keep looking in and seeing what they have in terms of features there. They have a local pollinator garden map. So if you want to go out and see some of these uh, pollinator gardens, especially at schools or faith communities or in public spots, um, they have all of that information online. They'll also feature any events. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, many of these events are at Fletcher Gardens or perhaps um, events that they're partnering with someone. Uh, they, I know they were doing something with Tree Fest in the fall last year. So they also do some Mason Bee Box um, workshops at Fletcher and seed cleaning and things like that. So they definitely will have a lot of that um, available for people. And then other resources uh, like this faith community tip sheet that we just went through, um, website links, research links, and the assessment tool. And also they've created a sign. So if you really wanted to um, help get the word out in your garden, you can print off a sign like this one um, to let other people know what you're doing um, in terms of creating a pollinator garden and um, supporting wild pollinators. So, so just in terms of a summary of how to be a wild beekeeper, uh, a good reminder, choose organic um, as much as possible, whether that you know means that you're um, buying from a local organization, you're getting some plants from your neighbor or a church group, or um, there's uh, one nursery here in Ottawa that's organic and some other smaller um, companies that are offering organic plants. Simple and easy, add um, as many native perennials as you can. And you know, keep that in mind in terms of making sure that it's native. So I was at, I think it was Richie's this year and I, I did see native plants, but I also wanted to confirm from them um, what type of chemicals were used on them. So they were able to give me that information before I purchased any. And you'll also see um, Canadian Wildlife Federation um, grows uh, organic plants um, to support different types of wildlife. So they'll have bee plants, bird plants, um, and like sort of um, small kits that you can buy, like four different plants, I think. Um, and those were at Richie's for sure. And I think they said they were at Home Depot or something. So look for those next spring if you're wanting to have a simple, easy way of adding some native perennials. Really consider um, not having a weed barrier. You know, that really degrades the soil. It um, doesn't allow, you know, for re regeneration. Um, healthy microbes, etc. Uh, it does, I know that, you know, the whole idea is making gardening easier. Um, it would be great to see us go to more of a urban meadow, embracing an urban meadow type of look where there's, you know, um, plants are allowed to ebb and flow a bit more and it really is just this sort of really consistent meadow look rather than, you know, plants that are very separated from each other, you know, and may look like a more familiar type of ornamental look, but, um, you know, a lot more maintenance in terms of those types of gardens. And so we'll see if, you know, we can sort of switch things up a bit. Um, also, that reminder of leaving some areas in your garden uncovered 
um, no, like, uh, no mulch. Mulch is too heavy for bees to move. And then providing access to clay or mud and things like that. Um, less maintenance, which is, you know, a great um, thing. I think um, I was just looking at this website that new to me today, and they were saying, you know, there's a lot of things you, you can sort of do less of that will support uh, wild bees, native bees more, you know, less maintenance, less cutting of lawn, all these things, um, and it will actually support and create more habitat. Um, providing water, um, that, you know, is uh, another thing we always have to think about habitat in terms of those things, you know, food, shelter, water. And um, I really like the idea of getting certified. I find that um, if you're, you know, certification kind of gives you sort of this um, goal to get to. And a lot of times, I think we talked about this a bit in the first webinar, organizations will support you in terms of certification. So they'll provide you with education and information so you know, um, you know, what you want to do in terms of being certified. But it also, um, if there's opportunities for signs or any kind of way of getting that information out to your neighbors. I just love the idea of using your garden sort of to promote these this information out there. And we'll do a little bit more in terms of um, getting certified in the last webinar. And I know Canadian Wildlife Federation will talk about that next webinar, the third one, in terms of their wildlife friendly garden certification. But um, also in uh, Faith in the Common Good on our uh, fact sheet number seven, wildlife friendly gardens, we talk about different types of certification that you can get. There's specifically one for bees, there's one for monarchs, there's one more general um, for bees, obviously, um, from wild pollinator partners, what's well, maybe not a certification, but just a sign. And then, um, you know, one for wildlife. So it's a great thing in terms of like what your interest might be and what you want to support, uh, being able to be certified. And I wanted to show this image as the last image just um, for us to sort of see, you know, the different sizes, the different um, looks, colors, everything in terms of bees. This is just 100. And if you think of Canada, that we have 800 different types of bees, um, you can just imagine the diversity that there is out there. I'm just looking over and um, there's no questions right now, but if anybody um, has a question, if you want to feel free to unmute yourself, um, you can type something up. Just want to thank you so much um, for being here tonight. Oops, I went the wrong way. So questions, discussion. I'd love to hear okay. if anybody, hello. Hi, it's uh, John calling. Hi, John. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, just to let you know, I've <clears throat> been doing the gardening at my home. We do have um, bees at our diocesan center here. Oh, yeah. And uh, which has, uh, you know, been going on for a couple of years. And we've had a session here of explain explaining things. I just was not aware of the numbers of kinds of bees that are there. Same here. <laughs> but, yeah, but the one thing is that, you know, it's to promote... Um, from my way of thinking is monarch butterflies. Yes. <laughs> What's happening. And I'm just wondering how do we go about getting milkweeds on our properties? You know, what, what is the way of getting milkweeds out there? Is there a way of doing that so that we can support the monarch butterflies as well? Yeah. So there is definitely like Fletcher wildlife gardens has a plant sale every spring and mm -hmm. they will be selling a milkweed. I think I can find out if there's some other places online. And I think there's, um, I'm trying to think of the name of the place in Quebec that is selling plants at um, Westboro Farmer's Market. I'm thinking they might have milkweed and I'm not sure, but I can get back to you on that. Yeah, I'd like to know. Yeah, and, and uh, one thing I wanted to say is um, common milkweed is not the best uh, milkweed to put in um, a more ornamental type of landscape because mm -hmm. it can really <clears throat> kind of take over. Yeah. I've heard that swamp milkweed, um, because, you know, as long as you watered enough, but not too much, you know, it, it will stay sort of in its place and it's a bit more tame. And then there's another type of milkweed that's better for um, ornamental like gardens that, you know, so that <laughs> is a consideration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. And that um, um, John is on um, just off of Bank Street, right? The diocese where the bees are? 
can hear you. Yes, we're we're on um, the corner of Lemira and Kilbourne Place. So it's on Kilbourne Place, Kilbourne. very close to Billings Bridge. Nice. Yeah. All right. And we have a large property here, and so uh, we do have, uh, with uh, support of the Eastern Ontario Bee Association, we've we've got some bees that have been on our property just again to be supporting the bees and the plants. So European, the honeybees. Um, they're honeybees. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, I we had someone else um, last time on the uh, webinar, and we didn't have any time for a discussion. But I'm I'm always curious in terms of the reception of congregations um, once we start doing a bit of a, a pollination garden or trying to educate people in terms of pollinators and maybe why you're you know making some changes to your space. I, I had a comment. Yeah. Um. What I'm trying to get my head around is I have grandchildren yes. <laughs> and I know that I want to support the, the bee, you know, the bee communities, but at the same time, when you have little kids running around, I guess you have to figure out how to do that. Maybe where I place the plants in the garden or. Yeah. And so many of the wild bees are known to be very docile. Um, okay. Honeybees are known to be a bit more territorial because they're protecting their hive. But because there's really no hive to protect, uh, wild bees are really known to be docile. I really, I should send you this. There's this, I don't know if it's a video or this story, but I think um, this one, I think it was the elementary school. They found out that um, they had, and I think, I'm trying to think, they call it the tickle bee. So this bee was emerging all the same time, um, early spring on this elementary school's, I think it's like a football field or something or whatever. And the kids were just seeing all these bees around and they were so like calm, they started calling them tickle bees because they could actually touch them and the bees were just like, whatever, <laughs> nothing happened. And um, yeah, so very, you know, very slim chance in terms of, uh, and many of the bees don't have stingers. So I can't remember there's, you know, whether the male or the female, some of them might, but, and, but yeah, so you may when, want to think of, sorry, more where they're nesting, you know, so in terms of them being on a flower, it's probably not a, a worry, but sometimes, you know, if they have a nest and somebody might like step on, you know, you can right. see the sort of like little tunnels that are coming up where the bees are nesting in the ground. So as long as, you know, any bare soil is kind of further back in the garden. It may also be a good way to teach the children to respect the plants. Right. Because there's bees on them. <laughs> exactly. Right. And have them sort of observe and, you know, see what's happening. So it's a great teaching right. moment. I love that. Yes. Yeah, that's great. All right. So I see that we are close to eight. And I just wanted to do um, a quick uh, shuffling in terms of prizes. Actually... I mean, there's only three, and Carol's already has a prize, so we can award Barrett and John the other two prizes for being here and being participants tonight. So what I'll do is I'll get back to um, all three of you, and uh, plus the other participant that won last time, and I'll start doing a delivery of those prizes. I'm kind of excited. So it's um, two books, one on birds, one on bees, and then one of these um, really well-designed Mason bee boxes and also what is that on uh, the, the irrigation hose and then some actual seeds mm -hmm. that there's it's a amount of seeds for a hundred square oh, I can't remember if it's feet <laughs> I don't know but it's, it's quite a bit of seed so you could um, you know in terms of the area that you can spread it on so you can divide it and share it with friends or you know with your congregation or whatever and promote a little bit with the bees and or do whatever you want so mm -hmm. I'll be in contact um, in terms of arranging that thank you yeah thank you. so here's a little bit of the picture here I showed it last time so um, I'm just waiting to get the bee book I haven't received the bee book so then I'll be able to do it there's your hose and then the other stuff. Um, so that's about it. I just wanted to remind people that we have two more. So we'll have Canadian Wildlife Federation coming up on Wednesday, February 26th. And then the last one, um, March 11th, and that will be again in the evening. But the 
a Wednesday one um, in February is at noon. So I'm just trying to switch up the times and dates and so that um, people can come depending on their availability. And uh, as I mentioned before, there's lots of information in the fact sheets and case studies and great local examples in those case studies. And then um, that's about it. Thank you so much for coming. And I look forward to you joining us next time also. Okay, I, now I had it uh, February 26th. I had it from seven to eight. You're saying it's at lunch, noon? Let me just go back here. Let's see if I can figure out how to go back. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, so the next one is again at noon. So at the noon. first one, okay. yeah, the first one was at noon. So we're doing noon seven, noon seven. So yes, so the Wednesday is at noon. Okay. And you'll get some reminders that Perfect. will come out the day before and then an hour before again, just to keep you ready to participate. Okay. And Wonderful. If someone else is interested, I'm thinking of somebody I might want to, we can invite them to join us too to register for it. Yeah? Yes, That's please. Possible. That would be great. Okay. If it's possible, I'll try to do that. Yeah. Okay. And you know, we won't be recording the next one because Canadian Wildlife Federation um, will be having this presentation at other times that mm -hmm. they give it to give it themselves. Mm -hmm. So they didn't want to have it recorded, um, but we'll record the last one also. So if you miss anything, you can always see them later. Okay. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, this has been wonderful. All right, have a good night. Yeah, okay, bye-bye. All right, take care.